Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 12 Down in the airlock bay, Miller watched the monitors while Stark deployed the umbilicus, carefully extending the heavy plastic tube from the Lewis and Clark to the Event Horizon. Locking the docking collar in place over the outer door, at least Weir and his team had done something that followed standard protocols. Miller's crew could have managed without using the umbilicus, but their lives would have been far more complicated. Miller turned away from the monitors as Cooper, behind him, said, Come on, Skipper, I already put my shoes on. It was a bit more than his shoes, Miller noted. Cooper was ready to hit space at a moment's notice. All he needed to do was get his helmet in place. Miller was already fully rigged for EVA, as were Peters and Justin, the bulky suits making it a little difficult for them to move in the airlock bay. Cooper dropped Miller's helmet into place, sealing it securely. Cooper seemed to have an almost infinite capacity for extravehicular activity. A liking for EVA was a rare thing even in the Big Rock range, where being outside was a daily occurrence. You've had plenty of EVA, Coop, Miller said, his voice muffled by the helmet. It's Justin's turn. Stay on station. If anything happens... Cooper was all serious business. I'll be all over it. DJ finished checking over Peters and Justin for problems with their suits. He walked over to Miller, checking seams and connectors, confirming the helmet seal. Any survivors are going to be hot, Miller said to DJ. DJ nodded. Radiation I can handle. I finished his check of Miller's suit and stepped back. It's the dead ones I can't fix. That's, that's all we're probably bringing back for you, Miller thought, turning away from DJ and nodding to Peters. Opening inner airlock door, Peters said, doubly muffled through two layers of helmet. She turned and tapped the control panel in the airlock door. There was a resounding clank as the main lock disengaged, allowing the door to slide open. Miller stepped into the airlock, followed closely by Peters and Justin. Justin turned as he entered the airlock, pulling out the end of a safety line and attaching it to an eye bolt on his suit. Cooper had followed them, still making visual safety checks. One of the reasons Miller respected the man, despite the smart-ass approach to life, and he smiled now at seeing Justin setting up a safety line. You still need the rope? Cooper said to Justin, even as he reached out to check the integrity of the line and its connection to the eye bolt. I thought you were one of those spacemen with ice in your veins. Justin tugged on the rope, getting an approving nod from Cooper. I'd rather be on the rope and not need it, he said. As he tensioned the line a little more. Then need it and not have it. Now step aside, old man. Cooper made a face at this, but confined his revenge to making Justin bend down a little so he could double check the younger man's helmet seals. In a serious voice, Cooper said, You just keep your nose clean, baby bear. Clear the door. With a wave, Cooper backed out of the airlock. The door rolled shut, the locks engaging with a hollow boom that resonated through the ship. Warning lights flicked on. Through his helmet, Miller could hear the low hissing of air being evacuated from the airlock. He pressed back against the airlock wall, waiting. The seconds ticked away. Silence around them, the cotton wool feeling of vacuum shot through with the sounds of the suit systems, electronics and electrics warming and cooling, air aspirating through the suit ventilators, odd creaking sounds from the material. The outer airlock door opened, light poured in from the umbilicus. Miller turned and stepped out, launching himself. Stark had indicated that Weir should follow her down into the lower level of the bridge area. He saw no reason to object to this slight change of environment so he did as she requested. Waving him to the seat usually occupied by the engineer Justin, Stark sat down and started activating monitors and consoles around them. Weir turned his head, taking in the different displays. Three of them were direct video feeds. Time code and names had been overlaid in the lower right corner. The monitor for Miller's video feed was directly in front of Weir. At the moment, the feed showed only the featureless interior of the umbilicus. Once in a while, a figure would drift into range. Next to Weir, Stark said, Video feed is clear. Smith climbed down behind them, his eyes on the monitors. Are you with us, Dr. Weir? Miller, made tinny and distant by the radio system. Something looming up on the monitors now. 
Weir was just beginning to react with excitement as Miller, Peters and Justin closed in on the event horizon. He should have been with them, but he could not win every battle. Perhaps it was to the good. Let the professionals face any initial danger, and then go in to open up all the secrets hidden within the ship. Weir focused intently on the monitors now. I'm with you, he said. You've reached the outer airlock door. Miller did not waste time with the Event Horizon's outer airlock door, motioning for Justin to get it open in a hurry. Justin quickly complied. Peters pushed by him, then getting a thumper up against the inner airlock door. The device admitted burst of sound, measuring the return response. Peters scanned over the readouts. We've got pressure, she said, putting the thumper away on her belt. Clear and open, Miller said. He and Peters got out of Justin's way. Justin floated up to the inner airlock door, turning himself carefully. He reached to his utility belt, extracting a slim tool, inserting this into the airlock operations panels. The inner airlock door opened slightly. Particles swirled through the gap. Crystals of ice, frozen dust and more that they would have needed additional equipment to identify. Atmosphere from the event horizon would fill the umbilicus, helping to keep it stable as long as the docking ring seal remained intact. Justin continued working. The inner airlock door opened all the way, a doorway into pitch darkness. Justin stowed his tool and checked his line as Miller led the way into event horizon. Their helmet lights caught ice crystals whirling in the silent darkness, and lights scattered around them, only to be swallowed in the darkness. Miller glanced around, trying to get some sort of perspective. As far as he could tell, they had stepped into some kind of access corridor, but the corridor was seemingly endless an immense pool of darkness broken once in a while by a deep blue patch of light that he assumed resulted from the windows filtering the light from Neptune. He looked up. Somewhere far over his head, his helmet light reflected from a ceiling. He could have used a hundred times the candle power, he realised. The lights they had with them would show them almost nothing. Jesus, Peter said as, as he looked around at her. It's huge. Trying to wrench his mind away from the scale of the starship, he said, Ice crystals everywhere. This place is a deep freeze. That was more for Weir's benefit than anyone else's. Weir's voice was in his head now, courtesy of the suit radio. You're in the central corridor. It connects the personnel areas to engineering. Miller was about to suggest they pick a direction when his attention was taken by something hovering just at the edge of the field of vision. Hold on a second, he said, Quietly and firmly, he started to crane his head forward, around. Everybody hold your position. Justin and Peters froze where they were. What is it? Justin said. I don't know, Miller said, edging around, trying not to move too fast. Small objects afloat in microgravity tended to prove all three of Newton's laws of motion. One too quick move here and they would be chasing this particular mystery down the length of the corridor. Miller edged down, closer, focusing on the object. It was small and white, a human tooth, complete with the root. Shocked, Miller said, DJ? DJ was normally unflappable, but his voice was shaky now. I, uh, think it's a right rear molar. Miller rolled his eyes. Time for the pragmatic voice. Yeah, thanks. I can see it's a tooth. Yes, DJ, he thought. This is not what we're looking for here. Looks like it was pulled out from the root, DJ added helpfully. This was not the sort of statement Miller wanted to have made dead centre in his head. As it was, Miller's spine was chilling, and he could feel hair rising on his arms. This was not getting off to a good start. Come on, Smith said, looking away from the monitors. What is that all about? Weir and Stark were both staring at the bizarre image on the monitor displaying Miller's video feed. The tooth floated there lazily in midair, flecked with fro- frozen blood and little bits of flesh. Weir felt as though he had entered a timeless place, one where the shadows lengthened and the light twisted all the images. His dreams came back to him haunting. Whatever had happened to the event horizon seven years ago, it was beginning to seem that the end result was catastrophic and ugly. Cooper had arrived at the flight deck now, nudging Smith aside as he leaned between Stark and Weir to stare at the monitors. 
This is some weird voodoo shit. The rescue tech exclaimed, shaking his head. We looked at Cooper and then turned back to the monitor, wondering what sort of answer he could have given him. Stark gave Cooper an annoyed glance. Get back to your post, Cooper. We wondered what, whether it mattered if Cooper spent his time here on the bridge or down in the airlock bay playing doorman. Cooper did not stick around to debate the point, leaving the bridge after a curt nod to start. The image on Miller's monitor shifted. Miller stood up straight, stretching his arms out, the motion sending the vagrant tooth spinning away down the corridor. This mission was beginning to give him the creeps, and that was not acceptable. All right, all right, he said, pushing his feelings aside and trying to regain his professional demeanour. Let's move on. Peters and I will search the forward decks. He turned to look at Justin, who was trying to follow the progress of the flying tooth. Justin, take engineering. Don't forget to breathe. Justin turned his head. Miller could just about see him smiling through the faceplate. I won't, sir. Miller and Peters started cautiously down the corridor. If Miller had his bearings right, they would eventually arrive at the bridge. In contrast, Justin tackled the travel issue by kicking off hard, aiming for a wall, turning over in mid-flight, and kicking off from there to increase his momentum. He vanished down the corridor, trailing line. Miller shook his head, smiling. Justin was good, but he was young and sometimes impetuous. He passed through an archway, surprised at the suggestion of gothic design here. It took him a moment to realise that the archway disguised a join in the corridor. Sections of the main corridor had been joined together this way, rather than simply being welded or bolted. He stopped and turned carefully, expecting inspecting the coupling. Near the floor, a box caught his attention. There was an explosive symbol on the cover. Dr. Weir, Miller said slowly, what's this? Before Weir could answer, Peter said, here's another one. She was at another coupling, hovering over another of the boxes. She pointed towards the other side of the corridor. They're all over the place. Looking around, Miller could pick out those within range of his helmet light. They nestled into the couplings at the floor or ceiling at the floor or ceiling level, looking for all the world like mechanical mollusks mechanical mollusks. They're explosive charges, we said finally. Miller sighed, shaking his head. I can see that. What are they for? In an emergency they destroy the central corridor and separate the personnel areas from engineering. The crew could use the fordex as a lifeboat. This made sense to Miller, though he had some difficulty seeing it from an aesthetic point of view. All this immensity, this grandeur, and panic button led to a collection of explosives out in the open. The event horizon had been the prototype. Not everything gets covered up in a prototype. Miller joined Peters and they began moving down the corridor again. This means they didn't abandon ship, Peters said. Miller was looking around again, trying to figure out what was really wrong here. So where are they? he asked. No answers were forthcoming. Chapter 13 Weir scanned the monitors with an almost boyish enthusiasm, concentrating mainly on the feeds from Miller and Peters. Right now. Justin's progress was more dizzying and informative. Miller and Peters had reached the Event Horizon's gravity couch bay. This would be one of the places they would find any crew members in suspended animation. Against all reason, we held out hope that they would find someone alive. Peters said, We found the gravity couches. The radio link made her voice tinny. There are 18 couches in the bay. Nine on each of, of the two walls, all essentially in the same form, size and function as those on the Lewis and Clark. The bay itself was considerably larger, of course everything aboard the Event Horizon was designed to be on the large side. Any crew? We said, as Peters and Miller each walked along a row of gravity couches. Negative, Miller said. We set back, drained, empty. It was hopeless then. No one left alive. No easy route to the answers. They had to know. There must be something aboard the ship. The video monitor showed nothing but one empty gravity couch after another. They gave no sign of having been used. Weir shook his head, trying to will something into being there. They're empty, Dr. Weir, 
Miller said. Weir's fist clenched, hopeless. Everything he had done ended up in a condition of hopelessness. He looked up and looked into the darkness of the event horizon and tried to think of Claire, but he could not get the focus now, could not bring her back to mind. Stark, Miller continued, any luck with that scan? Stark's hands were playing over the console in front of her. Weir turned his head to look at her and saw frustration written in lines and knots in her face. I'm running diagnostics now, Captain. She shook her head again, glaring at the readouts. Nothing's wrong with the sensor pack. I'm still getting trace life readings all over the ship. That should have been impossible, Weir reflected. Miller knew that too, going by the tinny sigh over the radio link. A change in the frantic movement on Justin's monitor drew Weir's attention away from Stark's predicament. Justin had given up his fastball flying technique now in favour of more considered movement. As Weir watched, the image from Justin's camera stabilised and focused. Weir smiled. Though it was an empty smile, Justin was about to encounter one of the truths of the event horizon. Justin stood before an immense dark door, perhaps the biggest pressure door he had ever seen in his life. Despite himself, he was extremely impressed. If he had believed in such books of mythology, he might even have found something biblical about it. As it was, it was big. God damned big. Huge, in fact. Cheerfully, he said, I've reached the first containment door. The engineering decks are on the other side, Weir answered. Justin felt a flash of annoyance at the scientist. Weir might be one of the most brilliant minds to ever juggle an equation, but he sure there was one cons- condescending son of a bitch when he felt like it. Justin did not bother to acknowledge Weir's statement. He reached out and touched the access panel at At his right-hand side, the door opened with ponderous grace. Justin was delighted to see that yet more mystery revealed behind this first containment door. He moved forward to see more clearly, and to give his camera a better chance to pick up what he was seeing. He was looking into a long corridor section, tube-shaped. The engineers who had built the ship had, for some arcane reason, set this section of corridor to spinning like a turbine, a shell outside the access point whirling at dizzying speed. From Justin's vantage point, it looked as though alternating sections were spinning in different directions. There was surprisingly little noise, but he figured most of it had operated in vacuum to cut down on friction. His head spun as he tried to focus on this weird assembly. Finally, he looked away, trying to get his bearings back. Cool, he said. What's all this do? Weir said, it allows you to enter the second containment without compromising the magnetic fields. Okay, so you're into big showy rigs. Justin suspected that same result could have been achieved with half the equipment and a quarter of the power. But he wasn't the one who had the brain the size of Betelgeuse. Looks like a meat grinder, he said, and stepped forward, his breath echoing in his helmet. Dr. Weir, what's this door? Peters asked. She had continued all the way down the main corridor until the Corridor had ended in a, pre- in a pressure door. She played her helmet light over it, over the walls and floor nearby. Nothing to be seen. You're at the bridge, Miss Peters, we said over the radio link. She took a deep breath and started to reach for the door controls. Miller passed through a hatchway into what appeared to be some kind of medical facility, either the operating theatre or some kind of surgical lab. All the tables were empty, reflecting his helmet light and as he turned his head he caught glimpses of surgical instruments and equipment floating aimlessly in the microgravity. I'm in medical, he said, ducking out of the way of a wandering forceps. He continued his exploration, moving cautiously through the room, inspecting everything. No casualties. Looks like this place hasn't even been used. Secured drug lockers, empty biohazard and sharp containers, just an ugly assortment of floating hardware to contend with. Miller's skin was crawling with cold. He was beginning to think Smith was right. They should not have come here. Over the radio link, Weir said, You still haven't seen any crew? If we saw any crew, Doctor, you'd know about it. He turned his head, looked down at the floor, looking for clues and coming up with nothing. Under his breath, he muttered, This place is a tomb. He took a step forward. Someone tapped him on the shoulder. Fuck! Miller yelled, whirling his hands coming up ready to strike out. An empty glove drifted past his faceplate, 
tumbling slowly. He stared at it as it floated away. His heart was thundering in his chest and his breathing was roaring in his ears. Miller! Stark was demanding over the radio link. You okay? I'm fine, he said. The words coming as a reflex. He slowed his breathing, tried to get his heart to slow down to more normal rate. He could feel the clamminess of sweat on his skin, cooled by the air circulating through his suit. Your pulse is elevated, DJ said over the radio link. Are you sure you're... I'm fine, Miller snapped, which put a stop to any further questions from DJ. He turned, pushing the fright to the back of his mind. Only inanimate objects, nothing more. Finding a computer console, he set to work. He had had enough of fishing around in the dark. They needed light, air, warmth. He settled in to start hacking into the ship systems. Weir hunched over his seat, his hands clenched into fists. He stared at the monitors, but nothing new was revealed. Where are they? He whispered. Stark turned to him, her face set. If anyone's there to be saved, Miller's going to save them. No one's got more hands-on experience than this. He's the one of the few captains who's ever worked the outer reach. That got Weir's attention for the moment. He's been past Mars? Stark turned her head, checking displays. He served on the Goliath. Weir shuffled information in his mind. The Goliath? Wasn't that ship destroyed in a fire? They were trying to rescue a supply shuttle board for Titan, Stark said slowly. The freighter's tanks ruptured, flooded both ships with pure oxygen. That was one of the great space and nightmares. A ship filled with oxygen that was a death trap about to happen. Miller and three others barely made it to a lifeboat. If not for Miller, no one would have made it. We gazed at her, thoughtful. Miller was strong, then resourceful. That was good, wasn't it? Peters had managed to open the hatch to the bridge. Taking a deep breath, she eased inside, glancing quickly around. Okay, she said, I'm on the bridge. She moved slowly around, finding a briefing table and several chairs. This was an antechamber to the bridge, a small briefing room that the crew would have used for mission discussions and assignments. She looked over the table and chairs, but found no indication that they had ever been used. There was a brilliant flash of lightning, storm activity going on in the atmosphere of the planet beneath them. She started to look up, but the flash had thrown off her night vision for a few moments. She turned to move deeper into the bridge, leaving behind high up on the wall, unnoticed, a frozen mass of blood and tissue that had once been a living human being. Miller worked at the science station for a couple of minutes and was suddenly rewarded by displays lighting up. He smiled to himself. Something was finally going the way he wanted. This was something he could deal with. Pausing for a moment, he said, Science workstation has power. I'll see if I can find the crew from here. He got back to work. We're not going to find anyone, Smith said to Stark, his face an angry mask. This place is dead. We ignored him. Ignored Miller's monitor and Justin's continuing walk into engineering. He was staring at Peters' monitor now, reading the details of the bridge as best he could. They needed to restore power to the event horizon as quickly as possible. Miss Peters, Weir said softly, turn back and to your left, please. He watched his Peters camera view move, bringing something new into view. Stark leaned over, peering at the monitor, then at Weir. What is it? Ship's log. We said. I see it, Peter said, and the view on her monitor shifted again. Peter stepped toward the log unit. It was really nothing more than a small video disc unit built into one of the consoles, but it was enough to keep a running record of bridge and ship activities. She reached down and pressed the eject tab. Nothing happened. She leaned down, checked that it was receiving power. Small green light was glowing in one corner, of the operations panel. She tried the eject button again, without success. It's stuck, she said. She reached down to her utility belt, extracting a small probe. Carefully, she slipped the probe into the video unit, feeling around until she was sure she had the eject mechanism. She pressed down, pulled back, felt something give. A tiny laser disc emerged halfway from the unit, jamming there. 
Peters grasped it carefully and pulled, but the disc would not move any further. She tugged again, frustrating herself in the effort. It's really jammed in there, she said. She sighed, then growled softly. They needed that disc. Needed it badly, and might well answer a lot of the questions about the fate of the crew, and might even answer some of the questions about the disappearance of the event horizon. All things considered, she would be glad to see Weir's mind put at ease. She tried the probe again, trying to pull the laser disc away from whatever part of the mechanism was jamming it in place. This did not seem to help. Once again, she grasped the disc and pulled, was frustrated, tugged harder, thought she had it this time, but didn't. All the air rushing out of her in one explosive gasp. She put all of her strength into getting the disc loose. This time it came free, sending her spinning and tumbling in the microgravity. She flung an arm out, trying to stabilise herself long enough to get back to the position where she might be able to stop her motion. Her heart leapt into her mouth as her helmet lights flashed on something floating in the bridge with her. She turned helplessly, only to find herself being struck by something with considerable mass. Holding onto the laser disc with her right hand, she reached out with her left, grasping cloth, and beneath that something hard. A face came into view, lit brightly by her helmet lamps. A man's face, contorted, mouth open, swollen tongue protruding. The veins stood out, bloated and frozen, all over his face and neck. She stared for a moment, her breath catching in her throat. She pushed away from the body, rebounded from a wall, managed to bounce herself down to the deck, catching hold of the edge of a console to stop herself from moving any further. Her tone, utterly professional, said, I found one. Her heart was pounding, but it did not feel as though she was in any danger of her control slipping. Good enough. Over the radio link, Miller said, Alive? Corpsicle, she said. She lifted her head, aiming her lights up at the floating corpse. Anchoring herself against one of the console units, she reached down, snagging the corpse by a foot, pulling it down. We're set back now, regarding the face of the dead man on Peters' monitor. Whoever he was, he was a mess, and they'd be lucky to identify him easily. DJ came into the bridge, joining Weir and Stark at the monitors. What happened to his eyes? Smith said, staring at the screen. Explosive decompression, Stark said. DJ shook his head. Decompression wouldn't do that. Weir had to agree there. The dead man's eyes had been gouged out. Going by the images, that would have to wait for the time being. Justin had finished his long walk. Chapter 14 Justin walked slowly out of the spinning tube, his head filled with an annoying buzz he knew he would not be rid of for some time. He looked around, finding himself in some kind of operational alcove that opened out into the huge spherical chamber. It was not easy to see anything. His helmet light reflected from a grey slick that had seemed to coat everything in the alcove. He had only a moment to try and figure out which way to turn before something wet and massy stuck in his suit. Something wet and massy struck his suit. Liquid grey shot up in front of the faceplate. Out in front of his hands, splashing all over his fingers, other floating globules of liquid caught the light from his helmet. Then his light was gone, coated by the same thick grey fluid as another globule struck his helmet. He reached up, trying to clear the stuff from his helmet. He managed to get some of the light back, but it was very little help. This was already trouble, and not likely to get much better if he stayed there. For the benefit of those on the bridge, he said, I'm in the second containment. There must have been a coolant leak. He wiped at his face plate. He wiped at his face plate and helmet lights again. Looking around, he was able to get an idea of just how much of the grey stuff was actually hanging in the air. Fluid in microgravity was a menace. Man, this shit is everywhere. I can't see a damn thing. That wasn't quite true. There was a console nearby, facing out into the larger chamber. He could see some dim lights on the board, beneath the muck. He floated himself over to it, batting balls of coolant out of the way, mainly causing them to be smaller balls of coolant. Grabbing the edge of the console with one hand, he hauled himself down, anchoring himself as best he could, while he used one glove to wipe coolant away from the console. He tried not to think about the radiation level. His attempt at clean-up yielded good results. The board was alive and functional, operating in standby mode. 
He tapped keypads and was rewarded by the appearance of a variety of readouts. The reactor's still hot, he said, putting pieces together as he gathered data from the console. Coolant levels on reserve, but within the safe line. He tapped in more commands. The lights came up abruptly, almost blinding him. I did it, he crowed, feeling pleased with himself for a moment. The air was thick with lead-grey balls of coolant. He looked around, finding that the viscous fluid had indeed coated just about every surface. He turned his attention away from the control area and looked out towards the larger chamber. That chamber had lit up too, lights coming on at all angles. Justin stood and stared for a few moments, his mouth hanging open in an awe. He had expected a large open area here, but this was off the scale. There were baseball stadiums smaller than the second containment. The curving walls rose for dozens of metres overhead, sank for dozens of metres below. A rippling darkness studded with the spiky forms of control rods. Holy shit, Justin said, trying to take it all in. At the centre of the second containment, as black as midnight, was an unholy-looking construction. Justin estimated it to be at least 10 metres in diameter, perhaps larger. A broad torus covered on the outside by a series of spikes, occupied on the inside by a huge dark sphere that resembled no- nothing more than a rotted, malted orange. Trying to make sense of the construction, Justin felt his sense of perspective being twisted around. He felt faintly sick. Parts of the device seemed to be moving, shifting. The surface, slick and oily. He had the feeling that there was enormous power here. Time and space were under siege. His gut clenched. Justin. It was Cooper. The voice jolted him back into place, letting him grasp his professional state of mind. I think I found something, he said. He could not stop staring. Stark, Weir and Smith were huddled around the monitor carrying Justin's video feed. For a while, the images had been smeary, thanks to the coolant, but Justin managed to remove most of it, clearing the image up considerably. The addition of decent amounts of light had helped. Weir felt relaxed. The event horizon was not in the best shape, but it was still flightworthy, perhaps even capable of carrying out its intended function as of warp light. Perhaps even capable of carrying out its intended function of warp flight. What is that? Stark asked, pointing at the construction in the middle of the screen. It was tricky to watch, even seen through a relatively poor vid feed. The device seemed to shift and twist, playing hell with the rational perspective. We are set forward, not bothering to hide the pleasure he felt in his creation. That's the core, the gravity drive, the heart of the ship. Smith turned to look at Weir. You built that? Yes. Smith was silent for a long moment, watching Weir. You didn't have a very happy childhood, did you? Justin eased past the main console, down onto a gantry that led out into the centre of the second containment. From this point of view, the containment unit was even more impressive, even if it did feel like being on the inside of the universe's biggest Iron Maiden. He looked upward, having to strain to do so, seeing lights overhead that appeared to be barely more than twinkles in the night. He had to wonder at the design ethic behind all this. Weir and his team had to have lived by night alone to have created something as grim as this section. He did not want to consider what it took to create something like this strangeness lurking in the heart of this darkness. The human mind was not meant to go around such corners, even if the corporeal form could make the journey. He was used to the notion of crossing between worlds, but this was a doorway. It would be safer not to go through. He closed on the construction, focusing on the sphere inside the torus. Something rippled across the surface, vanished, rippled again. The last thing they needed now was for this thing to crack open and spill itself all over the ship. I think I see something, he said, and he reached down to his belt, pulling out a tool, a sensor unit that would give him a better idea as to whether or not there was a rupture in the core. He leaned in towards the core. Stark jerked back, startled as Justin's monitor went to static. The radio link hissed like a snake pit for a moment, before the filters cut in and squelched the racket. Hold on a sec, Stark said. She did something with the console, but Weir could not get a clear view. You're breaking up! The monitor cleared for a moment, then the static took in again. Stark gave Weir a worried look. Justin activated the sensor unit, trying to maintain his position as he pushed it out towards the core. There was a hiss of static in his earphones, then Stark's voice breaking through for a moment. 
Justin! Her voice vanished again. His helmet light flickered off. On. Dimmed down. He hesitated for a moment, wondering if he should deal with it. Before going on. Probably just a result of the coolant splashing into his helmet. Either the lamp terminals or the battery unit getting crocked by the flying sludge. He reached up and tapped the lamp. Justin, come in! Stark was repeating. We sat silently now, watching her, while Smith leaned down between them, his face ashen. There was a beep from the console next to Stark. Startling weird. Stark looked down. The bioscan display, frustrating in its quiescence until now, was displaying readings into the red sector of the scale. Something was awry, Weir thought. Then again, something had been awry with this mission since they had located the event horizon. What is it? Weir said. Stark shook her head, going over the displays. I don't know. The life readings just went off the scale. Something's wrong, Smith said, his voice forceful. We almost spoke up in agreement, but choose to remain silent instead. Pull them out. Stark looked at Weir. Weir said nothing. Justin's monitor flared with static. Justin pressed the sensor unit up against the side of the spherical unit. He had expected it to be a firm contact, but the surface felt soft, spongy, almost as though it was composed by some kind of organic material. The shifting sensation stopped. Justin looked up from the sensor. In front of him, the core darkened, somehow taking on the colour of nothingness. All around, the containment unit seemed to be sharper, clearer, as though everything around him had focused, revealing incredible amounts of detail. Even the arm of his suit, the hand held out with the pressure sensor against the core, had an unreal clarity. Justin was aware of light. There was no sound. Then the power, a force beyond reckoning, that reached around him, intruded into his universe, enveloping him without pause for consent or complaint. The void rose up around him, embracing. Unresisting, Justin fell into the space between the worlds and was gone. Reality began to tremble around the core. Chapter 15 Cooper was not in the mood for this, not in the slightest. Baby bear, you better be kidding me. Justin's safety alarm was unreeling at an insane, impossible rate. Cooper had tracked the line usage from the start, watched it pay out fast and slow. Now it was paying out at a rate the counter had problems tracking. 350 metres, 400 metres, he read off. He grabbed his helmet, got it on, the adrenaline starting to pump now. Justin was in trouble. DJ helped Cooper seal the helmet down. A quick suit check, thumbs up. I'm gone, Cooper yelled, slapping the control to open the inner airlock door. His heart was pounding and he felt crazy. He hated this more than anything. When it was over, all he would want to do was throw up and shake. Right now, there was no time to think. The inner airlock door closed behind him. The outer door hissed open. Shutting his mind off, he dove into the umbilicus. Hold on, baby bear, he thought frantically. Papa bear's coming to get you. Like a nightmare, the event horizon loomed up ahead of him. He plunged into the airlock. Okay, listeners, this has been chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 of Event Horizon by Stephen E. MacDonald. Once again, Liam Anderson is our guest narrator for the rest of this book, and once again, Liam, you did a great job. Thank you so much for taking the time to bring this book to life for all the listeners here on the channel. And I hope everybody else is enjoying the book as much as I am. Please let me know in the comments section what you thought of tonight's chapters and the book so far. And, uh, you know, maybe give Liam a big thank you for uh, taking the time to do this for us. He's doing a great job, and I'm so happy to have him on board. All right, everybody, until next time, this is your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and we'll see you next time.